music and society. Uh, and he's also written three books. Um, one is called Osamba de Suas Fronteras, and which was published in 2011. Another one, which is called um, No Sera Nao Tem Di Sao Nao, um, which came out in 2014. And most recently, and I love this title, Annoying Music in Everyday Life, which came out in 2020. And today, Felipe is going to um, talk about uh, a topic that I think many of us can relate to, and that's loud music in public places. And this um, paper is entitled Men Play It Loud, Unwanted Music, Loudness and Toxic Masculinities. Felipe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joe. Well, at first, I'd like to thank Sara Lieli and Bia and all the staff for this organization of this, this forum. I know there's lot of work being done for us to be here now and today. Uh, well, I'm just open my, my cue here. Before going directly to the topic, it's important to mention that uh, it's very difficult to think about and to talk about masculinity in nowadays Brazil without linking it somewhat, somehow to the far right politicians that currently and unfortunately occupy the most important positions in the state. It's difficult to think about masculinity without mentioning uh, the way Bolsonaro and his sons and most of his staff deal with gender asymmetry, they deal with a particular way of thinking about masculinity. In the opening keynote presentation, Beatriz Polivanov quoted one of the most disgusting talks of this Bolsonaro, still before he was elected to the office. He said that the leftist congresswoman, Maria do Rosário, didn't deserve to be raped because she was ugly. According to this kind of twisted idea, Maria do Rosário failed as a woman because not only she was against the man's political ideas, she, was a very, she is a very important opponent in, in terms of political ideas, but also because she fails in, in a kind of requirement of beauty, beauty requirement. That, that is indeed, it was one of the topics Beatriz Polifonov talking in the, in the opening keynote. But the thing that gets worse, worse as he imagined the act of sexual violence as a, mean, a means to put her in her place. So it is a, in a way of imposing not only his maleness, but also forcing her to accept his ideas. Rape in his speech is a kind of pedagogical act. Um, unfortunately, it seems like Felipe Felipe's stream has frozen, so we're just going to wait a few seconds and see if um, he comes back online. I'm also going to try and text him. Properly can be then beaten, raped or murdered. Not surprisingly, this man supported enthusiastically the freedom to buy guns. During the last four, four years, it was reported a 300% increase in gun sales in Brazil. Let's remember, important to remember as well, Rio de Janeiro's Congresswoman Marielle Franco, who was investigating the local militia groups in, in, in Rio, and she was murdered in 2018, probably by illegal armed groups linked to Bolsonaro. Violence is the ground upon which this kind of toxic masculinity grows. At the same time, it's important to highlight that the, the violence is a, a floating category. It is used to refer to many different acts and things. And I'm going to explore a bit one of these uh, uh, inflections of the word. That we come, come to the question, what, what my, my my research is what, what all this has to do with music. And the answer, uh, in my perspective, the answer is power. Uh, to play music in, in a given space is to control the sound atmosphere 
in this space. Uh, music uh, produces a kind of invasion. Music invades bodies, invades the body, and it creates change. It changes heartbeats, it changes breathing, it changes the way we move. Music also frames ideas, behaviors, social engagements. In this sense, controlling the music within a space means controlling the conditions under which people are going to interact. This control, of course, depends on what kind of music is being played and mainly on the volume this music is being played. Loud music is much more effective to impose behaviors than low music. Especially loud music with some characteristics such as fast tempo, regular rhythm, high-pitched chorus, strong beats, and this kind of things. All these all these features are somehow associated with ideas such as energy, power, and also aggressiveness. Therefore, these features match somehow this conservative understanding of what are proper male characteristics. In a long-term research about annoying music, which came up with, a, with this book, Jero has just presented, uh, the research for this book, I did more than 70 interviews, and, and I was asking people about their feelings about unwanted, unwanted music. Most of them, reported several situations, different situations, in which other people played loud music and that bothered them. Most of these other people were men. Due to a general construction of masculinity associated with violence and with physical imposition, men are more likely to play loud music and pose it to the others than women. Sometimes they are quite, quite aware of this power. And this power is somehow taken as a desired performance, a desired masculinity performance. However, there are some situations that this, this imposition is more related to self-pleasure, a selfish thinking, of course, but according to which the male pleasure must be respected and it's more, it's more important than anything else. Music is control and music is also pleasure. We may easily associate this entanglement between masculinity, power and pleasure with hate culture Sexual male pleasure is acknowledged as a kind of necessity, as well as an achievement. And often in this traditional way of thinking about masculinity, this necessity ignores women's pleasure or women's pain. A necessity that as such should and could be imposed upon other bodies. Okay, but we don't have much time to develop this implication. And I'm not saying here that those of us who listen to loud music can be compared to rapists. Of course not. I listen to loud music sometimes. I'm not a rapist, so let's take it for, for granted, <laughs> okay? But patriarchy, patriarchy works in different layers, reaching different domains of social life. When I, what I'm arguing here is that the sound in position is a way to perform a certain kind of masculinity that is mixed with a selfish and misogynistic way of thinking. In many cases, the thinking do not care about the others, especially if the others is, are women. In many cases, but not always. I interviewed a man, for instance, that reported that in his teenage times, he probably had disturbed his neighborhood playing loud music. And he said, I discovered reggae music and I thought that was fantastic and everybody should listen to it. Then 
He told, he listened to the music very, very loud and opened the window so that everybody could listen. Everybody should listen. Similar, I have a personal report every Sunday, Monday, Sunday morning, a man walks down my street in front of my window with a very powerful sound box playing gospel music very loud. It is for sure an intentional act of music imposition in both cases, but in both cases, they are for good. I'm sure this guy, the intention of this guy, this gospel guy, his intention is to spread the word of God in our morning, welcoming the Sunday morning to everybody. Both the teenage reggae music and this gospel guy, they, they want to spread good vibes for the other people. Yet it is still an imposition. No matter if the motivation is self-pleasure, ambience control, or spreading good vibes, it is this imposition, it is a, a way to perform power. And like any imposition, it is also an act of violence. The point is, according to my research, men are much more likely to perform this kind of violence than women. In many, many of these case, cases, this violence is closely entangled with masculinity. And with a particular conservative, toxic, and poisoned way to think and understand masculinity. I was told I have only 10 minutes, so I'm going to the end of my presentation here, uh, saying that uh, it's interesting to think about loud music and gender. Gender is inescapable. Every social relation is based on gender, gender and music experience is not different. Music is a human action through which people negotiate ideas, negotiate belongings, behaviors, ethics. Sometimes it is not even put into words. Sometimes it's dancing, singing, thinking, exchanging ideas about experience. If we are to fight to dismantle these gender asymmetries, perhaps it would be good worth thinking about music violence and this disturbing ways toxic masculinity sounded in our daily lives. I think here I could only scratch the surface, but we could and we need to go deeper on this topic. I'm going to stop here and possibly we can talk uh, a bit in the end. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Felipe, for this uh, wonderful talk and also for this uh, really insightful um, connection that you've made between an everyday phenomenon and kind of a structural and a political question. Um, and I think this is a, a wonderful way to, uh, to move on to our next talk, where I think there's going to be a lot of um, points of connection, especially because uh, this next talk's take on the intersection of music and the public pra um, practice of music and masculinity is, is quite different. And I think that's really interesting. So um, this, our next speaker is um, Beatriz Costa do Nascimento. Uh, welcome. Um, Beatriz is a journalist and a master's student at the Universidade Federal Fluminense in Brazil in the university's postgraduate program in communication. She is also part of MusiLab, um, the Laboratory of Interdisciplinary Studies in Music and Culture, and LIDD, the Laboratory of Digital Identities and Diversity. And she researches the criminalization of funk, specifically in the city of Rio de Janeiro. And this is also the question that she's going to be addressing um, in her talk, which is entitled Thinking About Music and Violence Through Sound Practices. Beatriz. Thank you. Um, is my showing, my slide showing? Yes, 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 yes. there. Okay. Mm. Hello, everybody. 
Good uh, afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, sorry, Bishop. Sorry, one minute. Uh, my name is Beatriz Costa. I am a master student at the Federal Fluminense University. My proposal in this discussion is to reflect on the relationship between music and violence, exemplified by the funk music in the city of Rio de Janeiro, uh, specifically uh, by the subgenre Prohibidão. My analysis is based on, on the concept of sound depressions proposed by the Brazilian ethnomusicologist Samuel Araújo to think about issues related to prejudice, exclusions, uh, social injustices, and the lack of uh, recognitions of uh, organized. What is Prairie Funk? Uh, I will start by explaining uh, by, briefly what is the Prairie Funk. is a musical genre that is part of the Brazilian culture and in recent years has gained several subgenres. Um, for example, the, the Peribidon that emerged in the second half of the years of 1990 and the early 1000s, and has gained the notoriety, uh, especially among young people from the suburbs, for its uh, realistic portrayal of the lives of people from the favelas. Um, but in that decade, uh, policy inquiries, lower suits, and complaints appeared constantly and in functionality as a kind of repressive device against the, the advance of humility that this aspect of the Jerry Wood Summer Who Drive. Um, in 2020, the funk singers Cabelinho and Maneirinho really investigated the, for a supposed uh, crime apology in a song entitled Miguel. Rio de Janeiro State, State Deputy Rodrigo Morim denounced the singers to the civil policy, claiming that the word alemão in the song is used as a criminal fashion term that means German in English to refer to orders groups that are seen as invaders and the enemies. On social media, insulted the funk singers are uh, noisy disguise as an artist. But how is uh, this related to sound depressions? The concept is very complex, uh, but uh, basically it is about the power of music to bind the, what people want understand the, as reality. In, in other worlds, it is a way of working actions and thoughts together. The violence is a condition of a society that has many implications 
for the study of music in social life. Uh, Araujo, the author, explains that the violence should not be considered as something outside of music and cultural experiences, but readers is an intrinsic part of them, uh, they limiting who in, Interhuman relationships will be developed in a defined space and the time. Therefore, associating uh, the concept of the sound prices to the prohibition funk helps us understand the ideas, uh, assertions, and the meanings that music produces. This concept is about thinking about the actions when they are happening and what is capable of producing. In the case of Prebidon Funk, annoyance and conflicts. Think about the, these issues. I believe that the, the perception of funk is due to a broader process of stigmatization of favelas and their subjects. And we can not see this in the Miguel case mentioned uh, previously. However, I do, I would uh, to watch a uh, stanty prohibition funk scissors to be a type of political activism and starts act actually inciting discriminating. Even Tati, the singers claim not to be con conniving. Uh, with the lyrics and say that the, the make it as a political act to face these social tensions and think about an uh, everyday life that some prefer to ignore. To finalize, I would say that the criminalization criminalization, sorry, criminalization uh, of funk music is a trick, uh, a trick subject, and uh, I am still working on it, but for now, this is allowed. I, I am sorry for my English, it's uh, my first presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Beatrice, um, for um, for this insight into your work. And um, as uh, as I was expecting, this is a really, really nice contrast to what Felipe presented. And uh, maybe we can talk about this um, a little later. How this way of looking about looking at the place of of music in public um, can can come into conversation with what Felipe said. Um, but for now, um, we're moving on to um, a different topic, um, which uh, is obviously um, still related and still within the scope um, of this panel, but um, looks at the relationship between, uh, between gender and violence and the public sphere um, on a much uh, broader level and 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 uh and really tries to do something very daunting um i think and um this is the work of uh of three people and i'm going to briefly introduce them all um and one of them uh is here to present uh to present the work in the context um of this forum so um uh, uh the, the first person who's been working on this um on this project is uh kenya adriana silva who is a PhD student in educational sciences at the Faculty of Psychology and Educational Sciences of the University of Porto, um, where she also obtained a master's in educational sciences 
and she also holds a degree in pedagogy from the University of the State of Bahia in Brazil. Um, her, one of the colleagues that um, she worked on um, for this um, for this research is uh, Maria Jose um, Magalhães, who is a professor in the Faculty of Psychology and Educational Sciences at the University of Porto. Um, she also has a PhD from the same university in education sciences, and she's also a full researcher in the Center um, of Interdisciplinary Gender Studies and a contributor to the Educational Research and Intervention Center. And finally, the first person, uh, the, sorry, the third person to work on this project, but the first person, um, the one person who is here to speak to us is uh, Nirvana Frances Cardoso. She's a researcher in prevention of gender-based violence at um, the same faculty as her colleagues, the Faculty of Psychology and Education Sciences at the University of Porto, um, where she's also a master's student in education sciences. And she also holds a degree in psychology from the Federal University of um, Ceará in Brazil. And um, as I said, I was pretty daunted uh, by your proposal and I'm very, very excited to hear about this project um, which is called um, Discolonizing Gender-Based Violence Prevention, Contributions from Black and Discolonial Feminisms. Nirvana. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kiero. And hello, everybody. Firstly, I would like to inform you that I do not intend to exhaust in this presentation all the content on such a complex subject about which I will speak I also ask for your comprehension, since the works and the articles I read to make this presentation were written in Portuguese version. I ask you to pay more attention to content than to the precision of the normal photos. I apologize for any difficulties due to the quality of my English abilities. In having said this, I begin by thank you for the opportunity to participate in this forum, in this panel, uh, and let's continue. About the myth, the method, um, sorry. This presentation comes from my master's thesis on which I have been working for in this two years ago. The presentation is based on a literature review conducted in the Google Scholar database using the descriptors, prevention on gender-based violence, black feminist, decolonial feminist. These three descriptors. Next, please. Well, uh, taken from a, a publication called Facts and figures and in violence against women by you and women, we have the, the facts. Almost one in three women have been subjected to physical or and sexual intimate partner violence, non-partner sexual violence, or both at least once in their life. 30% of women aged 15 and older. The other effect is globally violence against women disproportionately affects low, low and lower middle income countries and regions. And I, I ask you to observe the map about this disproportionately affects in the world. Um, now, next please. Okay, now we have facts about Brazil, Brazilian facts about gender, about violence. Uh, we have a summary of data on violence in Brazil in 2021 collected by the Institute for Applied Economic Research. On racial inequality, we have the number of black people killed increased 1.6 times while the number of non-Black people killed decreased 
33%. About violence against women, the number of black women killed increased 2%, while number of non-black women killed decreased 26.9%. About LGBTQIA people, uh, the violence increased in case of violence against bisexuals and homosexuals by 90.8%. Cases of physical violence against transsexuals and transvestites increased by 5.6%. About indigenous people, death toll of uh, increased by 21.6%. Without counting the data that is outside what is present here, we have an unequal reality, both globally there are peripheral areas in the world regarding the protection of our women, but we also have an inequality between the realities of different women. Being born an indigenous woman in Brazil, for example, is a risk factor, just as being born a white and or middle-class woman in Europe or elsewhere in the world function, like a protection factor. The Black and the colonial feminist contributions help us to problematize the data presented. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay, here we have a, a contribution of, of black feminists in just one concept because we don't have many time, much time. And in order to produce practice that have social justice as an end, in this case regarding gender issues that encompass all women, it is necessary to pay attention to the difference between women's experience and not only the inequalities between men and women, as if these group, groups were universal and the oppressions one-dimensional. Such con consideration as a premise is necessary, yes. It is quite obvious that treating different things the same way, the same way can generate as much inequality as treating the same things differently. Like said, Kimberly Christian, the creator of, the creator of this concept, inter intersectionality. Intersectionality is a conceptualization of the problem that seeks to capture the structure and dynamic consequence of the interaction between two or more axes of subordination. It is specifically addresses the ways in which racism, racism, patriarchy, class oppression, and other discriminatory systems create basic inequalities that structure the relative position of women, races, ethnicities, classes, and others. Furthermore, intersectionality addresses how explicit actions and policies generate oppressions that flow along such axes constating dynamic or active aspects of disempowerment. Next, please. Now about the, the colonial feminists, I will, sorry. Uh, we have such analytical frameworks have emphasized to the concept intersectionally and demonstrated the historical and theoretical practical exclusion of non-white women in the liberatory struggles carried out in the name of women. So the feminist decolonial will um, show us an important mark of decolonial studies is the production of the concept of coloniality. Coloniality, 
while uh, while colonialism delimits a political and economic relationship of domination um, of another people or, or nation over another, the coloniality refers to power pattern. So I will I will put this part. But okay, coloniality is constitutive of modernity. So now we, we can we can see the iceberg. Then I, I put this aspects what in 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 the visible and invisible. So next next slide, please. Now I I show the the base based on the works of Maria Lugones, Coloniality and Gender, and towards the colonial feminism. I made the following scheme to present the modern and colonial gender system. At the top, we have the visible part and the bottom, the invisible part of the iceberg. So in the visible, purity and passivity of white females, reproduces of class and racial and colonial position. Uh, at the bottom, Perversion and object objectification of women of color. Uh, at the top, reduction to domestic and reprodu reproductive function. While white women excluded for collective uh, authority from the production of knowledge and from control over the means of production compulsive and perverse heterosexuality. Now, at the bottom, sexualization to justify exploitation, sub subjectivation as tirelessly and the strong woman to be exploited, violence against those who do not conform the heterosexuality, forced sex, labor exploitation until death, female racialism racialized as animals devoid of femininity, versions of women according to demands of exploitation and domination. Now I will I will finally we have contribution contribution to decolonize the prevention of gender violence based in fe black feminists and and decolonial feminists. Uh, it's about empowerment of racialized women a social and political concept of empowerment based on the struggles in the social movements of colonized women, Interse intersectional concept of women, the conception of women must be able to read the intersections of oppression that colonized women have been submitted. submitted. Recognizing and undoing privilege to repair the traumas of colonialism, uh, like Brother Quilomba said, many will, many will need to move from the comfort of denial to recognition, recognition and redress of inequalities. And prevention of gender-based violence, like a project of social justice in uh, um, intersectional violence that makes colonialities, continuities in the lives of, colon of colonized women is it still a current, current problem that needs to be faced as an ethical, political, social commitments of educators, artists, and scientists. Thank you so much because I, <laughs> I passed the time. <laughs> Thank you, Norman. Thank you for this uh, very impressive um, overview um, of, of your thinking and your work. And we're now moving on finally to the last talk in this panel, which um, very much connects to these questions, but um, we're moving into a different geographical context um, to that of Mexico. Um, but uh, at least in, in the abstract, um, there were also some references to Maria Lugones, so um, I suppose there's going to be um, definitely points where these two talks um, speak to each other. Um, and our last speaker um, 
that I um, that I'm happy to present to you now is um, Paulino, Paulina Trejo Mendes. Um, they're an artist and independent researcher with a PhD on development studies from uh, Erasmus University uh, Rotterdam. Um, they're also a lecturer on Latin American feminisms and Latin American feminist art at the University of Bonn uh, here in Germany. Their art and research projects bring together feminisms, decoloniality, healing, medical gaze, politics and spirituality. Um, and they collaborate in the self-managed publishing house Cooperativa Editorial Retos, bringing together work by rebellious academics, artivists and artists, and I love this. Um, they've also written for the feminist magazines um, Volcanicas Revista, Proyecto Calo, and um, Enre de Adas, and for the Latin American German magazine um, ILA. And I very much look forward um, to your talk, Paulina, which is entitled Aquí no pasa nada, nothing is going on here. Thank you for the introduction and for inviting me. It's uh, been very interesting to listen to everyone. I'm going to share my presentation. Um, please uh, let me know if you can see it properly. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. So I'm presenting an artwork, a piece, uh, it's a collage um, that I did. And um, I want to just give a little bit of a background uh, for this piece because it is tied to my previous research where I did my PhD. Um, there was some forms of resistance to the embodied erasure. Um, in, so it was of epistemicide, the erasure of ways of knowing, and feminicide, the erasure of uh, gender racialized, feminized bodies. Um, and I looked into how these two intertwine. But that was kind of what allowed me to build into where I'm going now, which is more into Latin American feminist artistic interventions. And this piece that I'm going to show is part of the research. Um, but it's um, is also grounded on, um, yeah, so on the research that I'm uh, starting now, that I'm actually working on now, which is on appropriating the body and the public space in the context of a minicide in Mexico. Uh, so I will go into my questions a bit later, but I just want to go into the background. And the background of this piece has to do with how um, um, art historian focusing on Latin America, Andrea Gunta and uh, curator Miguel Lopez have spoken of the disregard of women's artistic contributions. Um, and they mention it as a form of systematic censorship and also of the need to make memory through research documentation and of course through art itself. So um, I interested also on what uh, Miguel Lopez said in relation to how artistic interventions in Latin America have been a way to make memory and to not forget the victims of those forms of violence in what he calls the geographies of horror. And he is specifically talking about the years of military dictatorships and regimes in around Latin America in the 70s, 80s. Um, 67. So he mentions, of course, in these geographies of horror, uh, forced disappearance as a state policy. So right now in Mexico, 10 women a day are murdered. And since the war on drugs started in 2006, uh, 2,000 mass graves have been found and more than 61,000 people have disappeared. So to me, these atrocities also speak of current uh, geographies of horror using uh, Lopez's uh, term. So, but I want to focus on, and, and this is also why I bring art as part of the methodology and I'm focusing also in these artistic interventions because I want to focus not only on the numbers that allow us to understand the situation and to give a panorama of these horrors, but also on the stories and on the resistance, on the ways in which these violence has been resisted. 
So my choice um, here is not to follow just like a rational approach, but to also sentipensar and to feel, think through this specific form of violence. And this is how I want to understand it. And this means that I also uh, refuse reducing these to statistics because, um, so this means there is in flesh pain and anger that I know is collective and that runs through, through our veins. And um, this is a way of theorizing also our pain as a way to change and to challenge what sustains it in, or denies it. Um, so theory uh, in the way of uh, bell hooks as a, as a praxis, as a liberatory praxis. And uh, in this, like refusing to become a number and to be classified is also this rejecting this uh, symbolic erasure and dehumanization. So I am actually also seeking to, to create or to make memory and to theorize as well from, from this wound. So some of the concepts that have been useful for me um, and that are also, I think, good for understanding my work are the terms uh, femicidio, which in English is femicide. And that was coined by Diana Russell and Jill Radford in 1992. And it referred to the killing of women through a feminist lens. So this was very important because all of a sudden we were not talking about homicides of women, but this term allowed to, to give this gender lens to make it a gender violence, to make the gender violence visible. Um, later, anthropologist Marcela Lagarde took the term femicide and in Spanish femicidio and, and expanded it to feminicidio uh, or feminicide. And this implies a structure of impunity that allows the repetition of this violence. So for her, these are and should be considered state crimes. Later, anthropologist Rita Segato also um, started to, to talk about these forms of violence that take place in these bodies as new forms of war. And these forms of war were not between states, but between different actors, such as um, transnational companies or organized crime. So the bodies where this violence is displayed, where this power is displayed and these forms of violence um, and, um, and yeah, by any of these actors. So also adding to these, the conceptualizations of Dr. Julia Fragoso that she speaks that what is killed is also the cultural construction and the meaning of these bodies. And for me, this is very important because it also allows to understand the relevance of the other artistic interventions. So now to speak about the piece, this is the collage that I did and um, so to understand feminicide, my work takes the feminist philosopher Maria Lugones understanding of, of uh, race and gender as categories that are inseparable and involved in the destruction of these bodies and as a colonial legacy. Uh, then feminist uh, historian Aurora Levin Morales reminds that bodies are sites where history is inscribed, she, she says. Um, so what, and my questions then are, what histories of resistance are being inscribed on the bodies of those who experience gender violence in Mexico and whether artistic interventions can give an account of these histories. And the thing is that the Mexican state has shown a repression of protests where women take into the streets to denounce gender violence and feminicide. And the response has been to protect buildings and monuments from being spray painted and deploy riot police to do so. And we have to think also on how these monuments are also often representing the, the historical narratives of the nation state. Um, and meanwhile, um, official discourse downplays the violence experience. And, and this to me is a double form of erasure. So for on the one hand is the erasure of the bodies that have been feminized and systematically devalued um, under uh, the coloniality of gender, coloniality of gender being the term coined by Maria Lugones and with the erasure of the violence brought upon them. So this is the context where to place this collage, which is entitled, nothing is going on here. And to describe the image, the main figure is a combination from a photograph of uh, Pop uh, Pius 
2012 and the face of Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador. And on the chest hangs a pink cross like those from the landscape below where pink crosses appear on a desert. And these, have, these crosses have become a symbol of remembrance of uh, victims of feminicide. So the main figure holds a machete and is blindfolded, resembling the figure of justice, although in this case it's more of a mockery. He smiles shamelessly and he represents someone in a position of power, the state as an institution that does not care about women and girls and a misogynistic state that despises the feminine. So my take on feminicide, this is from my previous uh, research. I, I've come to understand it as a form of symbolic and material embodied and flesh erasure. And this allows me to also contextualize the political relevance of current feminist artistic interventions and to understand this as forms of resistance to such erasure. So um, I'm interested in practices that disrupt dominant narratives and that make visible gender violence and ultimately appropriate the body and the public space within the context of extreme forms of violence. And well, this is what I'm continuing to work on, but thank you. That's all. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you so much. So, um, Thank you all for, for these, these wonderful papers, these wonderful talks. We now have time, and we have a bit more time than, than seven o'clock, so please bear with us. Um, um, I'm now opening the floor for questions and reactions, and obviously the speakers can also ask each other questions. Um, as I said earlier, you can here in this room, you can either raise your, your digital hand or your actual hand, or you can also write questions in the chat if you prefer me to read them out. Um, and I think for those of you on YouTube, you can also um, comment um, and then the questions are gonna be passed on to me. Um, so if there aren't any immediate questions, I think, uh, oh no, there is one. Beatriz, you go. <laughs> Hi, um, using my privilege, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so I have um, a few uh, questions or, or, or comments, although that's uh, an awful uh, way to, to begin. But I was uh, thinking a lot about uh, the similarities or associations between uh, Felipe's work and Beatriz's uh, work as well. Uh, and this association with um, uh, music uh, music genre, gender, and specifically uh, the idea of machismo. So maybe about Paulina, I can can also comment on that uh, because I feel that machismo uh, uh, it's a really specific type of, of violence or social oppression uh, coming from Latin America, and so I wanted to hear a little bit more on how this can be associate, associated uh, with, uh, with funky, with prohibidon, how this can be associated uh, with the loudness of music, because um, this is really, uh, really interesting for me. And uh, this is another, another thing altogether. When I, I read uh, Felipe's title, uh, work's title, I was wondering, of course, in Have Metal, but I was also wondering uh, about um, funk, because in Brazil, that's uh, the music genres that we listen uh, more um, commonly. It's more useful. Use uh, uh, it's more common to to hear uh, loud music playing on public spaces. Uh, it's more common funk, or maybe even a uh, sertanejo that is Brazilian country music, more or less. Uh, but uh, you also uh, mentioned uh, a guy that passed on on your street um, playing gospel music. So I want to hear a little bit more about this, if it, it is possible uh, to like associate music gender, genre, uh, I'm sorry, 
uh, with with uh, gender and uh, with gender and how this uh, um, can be associated with uh, machismo as well. Um, and I think that for me, that's it. I, if, if am I did I make myself clear? I am really tired, so <laughs> I was a bit confused. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, Felipe, Beatriz, if you want to uh, react yeah, I can to it. Uh, I, I, I thought that we were going to have a round of, of, of questions, but I, but I can go very briefly on that, on that idea. Uh, I think there are, of course, some kinds of music that are more likely to be played loud. And this is not this is not something that necessarily may be linked to machismo or to a particular kind of masculinity the way I was putting here. Not necessarily, but it has to do, I would say always, very dangerous to say always to anything, but mo mostly <laughs> to the issue of power, of the idea of energy and power. So if you can, can go, in the other way around to think about once the, the hegemonic kind of masculinity that is demanded from men have to do with a certain performance of power and imposing power and violence. Uh, these gener, gener, gen, music genres that are likely to be played loud are particularly uh, easy to be used in this way. Uh, and of course, the case of gospel music is a bit different, slightly different. Once we have as well the idea of imposition, and this imposition is very important because uh, gospel music in Brazil is also played very loud. It's a very important the leakage from the church, especially Pentecostal churches outside the church. This is leakage, sound leakage is very important for them because they are spreading the word, they are having a kind of advertisement of their work as religious institution. And this and this music uh, administrative, the way they administrate music and sound in the place, in the street, in the neighborhood is very important for them as well. Uh, I think it has something to do with machismo and with masculinity. Yet we can also put other layers and other things that are also involved with this. Okay, I, saw, I said I would be brief. I wasn't that brief, but it's okay. Um, Beatriz, do you also want to react to this? I agree with Philippe Trotta. Uh, it's it's all uh, the the music is um, very important and the uh, power is power in the peoples. I sorry, <laughs> não estou conseguindo construir. Como é que eu, how can I say? <laughs> Oh, Bia, it's fine. If you want to answer me, like, because we are in the same research group, if you want to answer me later, I really want to hear your input on that. You can answer me later in Portuguese. It's fine. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. So um, the next question is from Sarah. Hello. Thanks, everyone, for your um fascinating presentations it was a really great um table um or mesa <laughs> um uh, panel is the word um my um i my question was uh for pa paulina and um, paulina your work really resonates with my um uh current phd as well so it would be really great to follow up after this um but my question was well firstly to ask you if you could just expand because i realized when you came to the end of your slide which is which was basically your your 
kind of uh, your 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 own thinking it f- fell a bit short so if you could explain a little bit more um uh, what the idea that you had in that last slide on where you've got to in terms of linking epistemic erasure with feminicidio femicide etc um and then my other question was also um for pa- paulina in relation to um, how, because you you refer to nation state signifiers, which are really present in your work, but also in a lot of the kind of visual and textual textual narratives that we see in in sort of globalized Latina um, activism, Mexican uh, diasporic activism, which is a subject I'm I'm working um, with as well. And my question to you was. Um, how do you think these nation state signifiers are, are performing um, in the context of, of diasporic activism? For example, the activism that some Latina um, uh, activists against um, uh, femicide are, are pursuing in, in, in European territory. Um, and just how, yeah, how these kind of um, signifiers um, uh, and perhaps, I don't know if you want to touch on um, uh, some thoughts on, you know, sort of stereotypes ar- around, you know, stereotypes are always linked to Mexico and um, and, and and female gender violence, and and whether you see it, um, whether you see these narratives operating kind of differently in 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 European territory. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, for the questions. Um, so on the first question, yes. So that's, um, that understanding of, of a minicide, like my thinking uh, and the process of it was pretty much my PhD work, which was five years. <laughs> so um, it's from my previous research that I build on for the next one, but I will try to be brief just to say then, that understanding two forms of violence, epistemicide and feminicide as form of erasure um, allowed me also to really look into the forms of resistance to these forms of violence. And I realized that these two forms of violence happen on the body. So to erase somebody's knowledge is you have to also be in a way systematically like dehumanizing and destroying these people, which for me was very much clear in relation to colonization. Um, and then in order to destroy someone to, to find it, because my kind of my, my thinking or my questions were, how come it's so normalized that the, these specific bodies, let's say women's bodies, uh, everyone who has been also uh, feminized, in some way is dehumanized and less valued. And of course, also those who have been racialized and using the the ideas of Maria Lugones allowed me to understand that there was really no separation between race. So gender in in Lugones uh, understanding implies this dehumanization, this uh, systematic dehumanization where uh, race and gender are inseparable. So that, allow me to to draw those links and and um, then then to really uh, look into how is this erasure happening which is the violence but also how is this erasure being resisted and to me it was clear that the links between also epistemicide and feminicide had to do with these and flesh unembodied resistance so that's just to keep it very brief for, for that question, because, uh, yeah, that's just like my whole thesis over there. Um, and on your second question, so um, I could you, for example, tell me who do you mean, or like when, when you, in the second question, do you mean if the people from the diaspora are also reproducing these like uh, narratives or ideas or if it's how, people from um, these territories um, are also understanding or reproducing similar narratives like that. I am not sure. Okay, 
I was just, it was more a question of, of how you think some of these narratives are being, are, are sort of being performed when they're enacted by um, activists from Abi Ayala here in, in, the, in, in European territory. It's more kind of a question of how these, um, these nation states signifiers um, that you were pointing oh. about the mixed Mexican state, um, how these visual kind of visualities, you whether I don't know what politics of reciprocity you think that might might be occurring or just any kind of reflections around around that, around the the, the kind of context in which they're operating when activists and artists are kind of tapping into these narratives. Yeah, so I mean, I'm not entirely sure about which narratives specifically you want me to comment on, but is it, for example, of what kind of symbols like people are like embracing when it comes to doing the, um, let's say, the activism uh, here, like situated like as, as outside, we're always, of course, linked within. Um, yeah, I mean, exactly, like symbols around Mexicanity and. Um, yeah. I mean, it is tricky. It is tricky because I think it can be very, um, very easy to romanticize certain symbols and to romanticize certain narratives. And I see, um, so taking, for example, I don't know, like a glorified uh, Aztec past without understanding or like as something that, that uh, gives some sort of meaning being someone racialized and existing, of course, with with um, within this uh, context in the global north, um, where you don't see yourself represented, when you're actually outside and you are actually in the margins. So I can I can understand that sometimes it is this kind of looking for uh, certain symbols on something that that can give meaning. Um, but it's true that it can symbols are also sometimes romanticizing either violence or or past that were also violent or that where 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 we don't see these um, like the versions we're getting from them are not the ones that have been really thought from outside the dominant um, logics already. So, so it's already in the, the versions or the perspectives that come from our official history and official history has been built to erase pluralities. And that is a problem. If we want to do things differently and decolonize, we can't just continue reproducing the same narratives, whether they come from that idealized history or not. Mm -hmm. So I hope that, re that responds to your question. Yeah, yeah, no, it does. I think my question is speaking to this, I think, like right. co coloniality of, of, of activism as a space as well, when it's taking place from here, obviously it translocates it according to those hegemonic um, narratives, but yeah, thank you so much. Unless there is um, a last question, so Fatima. Um, hi, thank you, and thank you for all the wonderful. Uh, my question, or rather, the comment is to the first presenter, Phil Philip. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name right. So, uh, when you said that music is used to assert power. Uh, okay, so I was thinking about this specific um, thing, uh, specific term called, can we call it hyper-masculine nationality? Because in India's context, in the context of India, uh, I have also experienced this. In your case, it's Christian gospels or Christian religious music. Uh, since the right wing has come to power in India, so all all the Hindus who form the majority, they kind of, you know, they are, they have become very loud and it shows in their music as well, religious music, religious songs. Since I am not a Hindu and I, I, I belong to the minority group, it has happened 
quite a few times, a lot of times actually with me as well, that very loud religious music will be played uh, just to assert that we form the majority, we can do anything we want. And, and of course I don't react, but I know what will happen when people react because people have reacted elsewhere in other parts of the country. So then I will be shown my place that you belong to the minority. So you have to be at the mercy of the majority. So here also this majoritarian politics, majority versus minority is at work. And um, it of course shows the power hierarchy, the power dynamics that who owns culture or the dominant culture. Yeah, so I was just thinking of along uh, these lines. Thank you. Achwa, could you please uh, repeat the last part of your, your question because I lost the, the, because my internet connection was unstable here. <laughs> okay. I, I so listened up to, up to when you, when you said uh, the loud music in you were, were spread and there was no reactions for your part, but some people do re did react. So the, after that, I lost. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So after that, I said that it's actually the majoritarianism versus minority group, majority versus minority. And since I belong to the minority group, if I react or if I resist, then there will be a reaction, a political reaction that will show me my place, that we own the dominant culture because we are the dominant power here. So culture is also used that way. I mean, in a hierarchical way, our culture, dominant culture, your culture, suppressed culture. Yeah. So uh, I think I made myself clear now. Yes, uh, what you, I think the, the, the case you, 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 you bring you bring here is interesting because it is, from, from my view, it is connected to the whole idea of music as a kind of power. And, and it overlaps the, the gender and it crosses it into cultural and groups, social groups and, and, and many kinds of, uh, of people who join together in order to form a group. And music is very important to to provide this uh, feeling of being part of a group and it, in terms of uh, being cohesion, co coherence to them, and also to mark a difference between this group and the other group. Of course, if I, have, if I think about minority and majority, it's very important that the majority possibly have lo lower uh, and have higher sounds because more people produce higher sounds, produce louder, uh, claim for their demands louder. I'm thinking uh, a bit about some few research about football fans and how they sing along and they support their teams through music, through sound manipulation. And this is a way not only to intimidate the other, but also to reaffirm their position as a group. In terms of religious practice, this, there are other layers, that, other things that are also involved with this. Uh, the idea of uh, communicating with a uh, supernatural sphere. So uh, every, many religions use music to kind of a, a, a tool to communicate with the the sky, the heaven, or else, or the, the entities of whatever each religion believes to be beyond the, 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 the world, the mundane world. So music is this, uh, happens to be this device that allows people to communicate with the otherly. Uh, and of course, to reaffirm their position as a group, as a religious group. Uh, and so, so we have lots of things that are entangled in this issue. What, what, could, what I try to highlight here is the gender issue among 
why people are using loud music. So it is, it is a, and, and I stress it's uh, some features that are related to individual uh, playing people as an individual who is playing and forcing it to the others. But we, we can extend this easily for groups. And of course, when you're talking about a group, we have, we can uh, also include gender-based debate, but it's a bit more complex. You have to study each case and see how far the, the gender is, what is the role of gender inside each group formation, inside each performance, music performance that's being played and it's being uh, uh, spread in that situation. And of course, the religion, the religion uh, element is very important as well. The music as a means to communicate to, to, with, with God and so on. So there are several, <laughs> several layers and several things that are crossed, uh, not to mention geographical, Debates and 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 fights, uh, groups. My street, your street, my neighborhood, your neighborhood, my district, my city, uh, against the other city, my football team or any sports team. All these conflicts are all not all, not always, but most of these conflicts are negotiated through music through music manipulation, sound manipulations. And it's interesting to understand that music is a power and how this is related in each, in each case to gender issues. That was, I don't think I, I have answered properly your, no, thank you. your comment, thank you but, but the idea is, is, is this. Thank you. Thank you for these questions. Uh, so thanks to the audience and thanks again to our speakers, thanks for being here. Thanks for um, bringing your papers. Thanks for engaging in a discussion. Um, this has been really wonderful, really interesting. Um, so, and thank you for all of you watching on YouTube, obviously. And um, thanks again to the organizers. This has been a real pleasure also for me. And um, yeah, the only thing that remains to say, have um, a great rest of whatever the rest of the day is where you are. And I very much look forward to uh, seeing you again in a different context. And as I said at the beginning, this forum um, is, uh, is going to be continuing until the 14th of October. So have a look at the program, join in some of the other panels and the events. And um, thank you. <laughs>